Okay, yeah. Um, thank you everyone again for coming to the talk. So this is just gonna be recorded, but don't worry, um, your face won't be there unless you're speaking and like highlight that, so it's gonna be okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're Develop, we're an organization that was founded in 2016 and we started out as just like friends in high school, um, trying to teach each other CS and design. Um, we were interested in learning about technology and startups because we came from a school without, I guess, um, an established CS education. <laughs> And um, since then, we've kind of just been trying to build a community of students in the Philippines interested in technology, innovation, design, and yeah, have just been building interesting products and adventures together. And we're really excited to be hosting Graham today because he was previously a core member and he very much embodies like the work that we do in our organization, which is um, using the technical skills we have to advocate for social change and to actually make impactful products as opposed to, you know, profit-driven ones that the Philippines really needs. So the Student Tech Talk series we have is just um, a kind of webinar series that we started out of quarantine. Um, students have been some of the most affected individuals in this crisis, navigating being kicked out of dorm rooms and just like the consistency of their campuses and just having to make their way through things. and. At this time, I feel like there's a lot of things that students have to share and there's a lot of value in what students can say. Um, and yeah, that's why we decided to start this talk series featuring our peers um, in creative and tech adjacent fields. So we really want to have these discussions as also a way to facilitate community and meet new friends and connections. So feel free to like reach out to Graham after and talk to him more about his experiences or anyone else. and just feel free to use the chat um, to ask any questions that you have or just like react to things. We're so glad that you're all here. So the talk is gonna be hosted by Ramona, <laughs> who will read his introduction now. You're muted. I'm so sorry. Okay, yeah. So you guys, most of you guys are probably friends with Graham. Um, so you probably already know this. So I'm going to say it anyway. Um, so Graham is an incoming sophomore at Carnegie Mellon University and a full stack engineer for Dashboard Philippines, um, which is serving the Filipino masses through the COVID-19 crisis. Um, they provide information on open establishments, shuttle routes, donation centers, hospitals, and more, which is really cool. Um, Dashboard Philippines is also partnered with the Philippine government, so the DICT, um, Department of Health, GLOBE, um, DND, um, and more. On campus, uh, which is where he is now, he is also the Director of Technology at Scotty Labs, um, a student-run interdisciplinary organization at his university, which is dedicated to removing barriers between students' ideas and their implementation. Um, and as you all probably know, uh, Graham is no stranger to Projects for Good, uh, working to build everything from tech for disability aid tracking, public transportation to monitoring air quality and everything between hackathons to large scale teams. So we're really happy that he's here today to share his journey, his current work, and his visions for what student-driven tech can do in today's time. Uh, Graham? Yeah, thank you. Oh, whoops. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Ramona, and thank you for inviting me here today for the talk. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share my experiences and just um, insights about how to code for good. So yeah, today I will be talking about what it means to code for good and how you can take part in it yourself, whether you are a professional, a student, or a hobbyist. So um, thanks to how quickly tech has progressed in the last decade, there are now tons of prototyping and development tools readily at our disposal. With them, it's become a lot more possible to create and scale up projects that can impact people, a lot of people, for the better. 
And so like whether it's deploying progressive web apps on Heroku and Netlify or um, making uh, native apps with Flutter, React, or Android Studio, um, Xcode, um, these tools give us a lot of power to make our ideas into reality through code. So coding for good is now more important than ever as more people gain the ability to impact the lives of others through tech. Now with all this talk about coding for good and impacting the lives of others, how exactly do you know if you're in the right direction towards helping people? So the key is empathy. Empathy is understanding and sharing the feelings of others, like putting yourself in their shoes so you can understand the problems they face, even if those problems don't impact you directly. In order to do this, you first need to think about who your end users will be and uh, who benefits from the products you're creating. What I'm, uh, you need to ask the questions like, is what I'm going to make going to do more harm than good or not? So developing this mindset is important in creating and coding for social good. So uh, for me, for example, uh, a key, um, for me, a key moment and a major point for me in developing this mindset was in high school. So when I got really involved, uh, so in high school, I went to Pisai for high school, for those of you who don't know me, and I got pretty involved with um, innovation competitions. And my high school physics teacher and mentor always used this um, Cebuano phrase, para sa hayag na kaugmaon, which um, translates to for a brighter tomorrow. He often used it as a motto to motivate us to persevere and work hard for a brighter tomorrow. But then I kind of took it a different way because thinking about striving for a brighter tomorrow isn't just about working hard because you can work hard for anything. But the question is, to what end? Working for a brighter tomorrow entails not just creating things for your own future or self-interests, which, I mean, you could, and that's fine, but working or coding for social good means creating things for the benefit of the greater good, because a brighter tomorrow isn't so bright if you're the only one in it. So coding for social good is somewhat related to this concept known as um, you can relate it to altruist, um, egoistic altruism. Uh, for those of you who follow Kurtz Kisak, he has a, an entire video on it. So yeah, so back to high school. Um, so my teacher always encouraged us to create projects that were aimed to help the needy or marginalized sectors. So um, what we, how, how my teacher taught physics before was like every quarter, we'd have this um, innovation project that we had to present, which um, sort of had to apply the topics we learned in physics for that quarter. And it's um, definitely a, well, it's a unique uh, strategy for teaching, to say the least. I don't, I don't know if it's being implemented elsewhere, but I enjoyed it. And I think that sort of instilled in me, like, uh, a passion to try to think of ways to make things that can actually help people. I remember one of my early um, days of making an innovation, what um, we, we used to call it just Innov for short, um, was like I proposed to make this like chat room thing, which I mean like it's innovative, I guess, uh, because like it helps people chat, like if you're on a LAN network, because like my high school, we didn't have like really good internet. So I tried to develop this thing that would help people chat, even if there wasn't any internet. And so it was innovative. But then when I, when I talked to him about it, he was like, yeah, sure. It, I mean, it, it's probably not that simple to make, but like, who, is it really helping people? And so what kind of like, it kind of drilled that question into my head. Like, am I really doing this um, because I want to, um, am I really doing this because it's easy for me or do, am I doing this because I actually want to help people? So, um, so what I did eventually, I ended, I ended up making a different um, innovation for that quarter. But later that year over the summer, I started thinking like, 
hey, why don't I try making something can actually help people? So that summer, I worked on creating this app called Unawa. So in Filipino, Unawa is like the root word for maunawaan or maunawa. So like, it's like to understand or understanding. Um, I wanted to create something that could bridge the gap of understanding for people who had communication disorders or disabilities. So um, imagine someone who's like deaf or mute. Uh, they face that communication barrier because they can't speak to you because of their disabilities. And their only means of communicating would be something like sign language. But then what if you're trying to converse with someone who doesn't know sign language? So I tried to make, I, I developed this Android app, which kind of um, translated sign language on the fly. And that was, for me, I think one of the, what kind of really drilled that lesson to me. Because like, while I was developing it, like, sure, it's fun, but like, it doesn't really impact me in any way because I don't um, typically interact with people who are deaf or mute on a daily basis. And, but then like, so like, why am I developing this? And I feel like there's, there is that sort of sense of fulfillment when you get to help people like out of the goodness of your heart. And I think that is the core of coding for good because you're, you're empathizing with those people who you know that like, even if you will probably never, you probably won't meet them every day, you can still make an impact in their lives. And just like seeing that smile on their face is like worth the effort. So yeah, just developing that mindset has become a, like a second sense for me now. But okay, so at this point, I just want to clear up some possible confusion about like what it means to code for good. When you code for good, it doesn't necessarily mean creating an application that immediately impacts hundreds or thousands of individuals. In fact, coding for good can mean like just making an HTML site to teach your younger sibling math or show them cool shapes because you're still doing it for their good. Uh, it can mean making a small alarm app to remind your Lolo or Lola to take their meds at a particular time. At the end of the day, what matters is that you're creating things for the betterment of society, whether big or small. You don't need to impact the lives of thousands of people. If you, if you can create a positive impact in the life of even just one other person, then you're already on the right track. Um, so how exactly can students contribute? I think this is definitely one of the biggest questions we face as students in tech. So the world outside school is large and um, often that comes with a feeling of intimidation that we're all just small individuals who can't make a difference. The thing is though, that's wrong. That is very wrong. You see, the only difference between us students and people out there is just the fact that we're still in school but that has no bearing on our capability to make a difference in the world. The only difference probably being experience or skills. But you see, trust me when I say this, but the tools and skills you use in tech in the outside world are often things you don't even learn in school to begin with. Yes, the things you learn in school are important, but a lot of these skills you learn on your own. And if you, once you have that drive, that initiative to learn the skills yourself, you will be able to make the difference. It doesn't matter if you're students or not. We have just as much as, we have just as much potential as anyone else out there. Getting to the point of being able to impact a large amount of people through your social good projects is simply the destination at the end of a long journey. But until you make that first step, you'll never know what you're truly capable of. So now for like that first step, um, I think it's like, there are tons of tools out there. And so at the end, this is basically the end of my talk now, but then um, I'm just gonna put some, I think interesting prototyping or deployment tools. So like if whoever is interested, you can use so like Heroku, Netlify, Flutter, React Native. I think these are great tools that you can use if you're like starting out development. Um, because making apps 
web apps, um, native apps, using these things, you can already make a difference through those. And um, yeah, that's basically the end of my talk. Thanks. Uh, you can ask questions on the poll. Yeah. Thanks, Graham. That was a good talk. Thank you. Um, I think it's interesting, though, that you started getting into it because of a physics class. Um, I think that's pretty interesting because uh, I'm not sure for the rest of you guys, but we didn't really have a lot of physics classes. I mean, we didn't have any. Our school was very heavy on projects, but we didn't have any projects in physics specifically that were catered to those who were marg marginalized. It was mostly in um, classes that were more Humes oriented, I would say. So I think that it's really cool that your physics teacher at the time thought to, <laughs> yeah, um, humanities, your physics teacher thought to um, encourage you guys to do that. And yeah, I feel like that's a really cool thing that he did or she did. Yeah, I think um, definitely it was like, that was a really nice approach. Oh, random fun fact though. Like, I mean, I got into computer science, not through those projects though. I mean, like I, I started getting into like more applied tech, but like my journey into computer science itself or just like programming um, was actually because of Minecraft. <laughs> I think like, for a lot of people. Um, Classic. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I think like um, uh, grade eight. Yeah, so um, somewhere, no, yeah, the summer before, no, summer after grade seven. So I was really into Minecraft before and like um, back then, like the summer after grade eight, I was like, I really want to make mods for Minecraft. And so I learned to code so I could make mods for Minecraft. And that's sort of how I started getting into programming. And then the rest just followed. It's really cool though. <laughs> yeah, a lot of my friends, because um, I heard that you were doing um, electrical and computer engineering is that right yeah yeah um yeah so I'm doing electronics engineering and a lot of my friends they said that Minecraft was actually like it actually really helped them in like the electronics courses that we have which is pretty cool because like you can play a game and still learn something uh yeah seventh grade I did not know how to make a powerpoint I <laughs> thought that that required complex code and hacker skills. So I was just like, when I was in a group and they, we had to make a PowerPoint presentation, I was like, can you do it? Because I don't know how to do that. Oh, oh sir, Edge has a question. So um, jumping into Flutter or React might be a big jump for the little ones. Um, uh, what can you suggest to provide a quick, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, what can you suggest to provide a quick jump into real world solutions development? So, um, yeah, definitely that is not um, always the easiest jump into real world development. Um, so, I think what could be easier would be to start out with web dev, perhaps. Um, some people find that easier to um, start out with because, especially, you can host it locally and you can. Um, with how much um, web frameworks have developed, you can make uh, web apps that are basically just as responsive as uh, as mobile apps now. Um, but if you do want to deploy to like mobile apps like natively, there are things like um, MIT App Inventor. Uh, I will type that in chat. Um, so app inventor, uh, oops, uh, app inventor. Yeah, MIT app inventor. Uh, I know a lot of my friends did that in high school to make like native apps. Um, it is a way that um, doesn't require as much complex code. Uh, from what I understand, it's similar to like how Scratch and Google Blockly works where you can connect components and uh, basically just deploy native apps without having that much experience coding. Yeah, I think it is the research go-to for a lot of people in the side because uh, even if you aren't as into um, app development, you can easily deploy apps. 
Oh yeah, there is a platform to interface in Arduino with code blocks like Scratch. Actually, there was an interesting project um, from someone in my computer science class, Scratch for Arduino. Oh, okay, yeah. There was an interesting um, project made by someone in my computer science class last, sem uh, well, now two semesters ago, so fall of 2019. Uh, she developed this, she basically made a similar system. It's like drag and drop uh, and um, you can basically make um, modular like Arduino code components just by dragging things together. So like drag this block and like make an LED blink or something. I think it's like definitely really amazing how, um, how much tech has progressed simply because there's like, it's, it's almost like it's basically exponential growth, I think, because the more, um, people learn about tech and how to use it, the more tools become available for other people to use. And so this, it, the cycle continues because the more tools get developed, the more, um, these, the more uh, ways there are for like people to make better things. Um. Graham, you're also getting some questions from the um, paullev.com. Oh, okay. um, yeah. yeah, someone's asking um, if you have any concrete steps in starting um, to code. Um, starting to code, uh, like um, starting to learn, like learning to code or like starting on a project? Um, I suppose starting e either. Or both, actually, because okay, you know, um, pretty link. So I will start with like, so learning to code exactly. Uh, well, I can't really give a specific example. I mean, for learning to code in general, I think it just really boils down to a lot of like practice. And there are now a lot of great tutorials out there on YouTube. On there's like LinkedIn Learning. Um, a bunch of there are a bunch of websites out there for like learning how to. Uh, learning how to code in general. But like for starting projects in general, um, I did have a concrete way before, but like actually last semester, I took this engineering class, which kind of, like it, it streamlined the whole um, ideation process for me. And I think it's like, you can uh, break it down to five steps and which I think are very important. So the first step is to empathize it. Okay. So, if you want to search this up, it's called the design cycle. It's like, a, it's an engineering concept. So in the design cycle, the first step is to empathize. You want to find, um, you want to find like a specific target group that you want to help out or like, um, so example, if you want to help out elderly, you identify them as, as your group. To empathize, so you need to feel like you need to, find the group that you can empathize with so that you can find the problem. So then the second step is define. So to define is to define the problem. So like um, uh, you, so you know the elderly is your specific group. So what problem exactly are they facing? So is it maybe like they have trouble walking long distances because they get tired or is it because of arthritis, what exactly is your problem? That is your second step. You define what your problem is. Third step is um, ideate. You brainstorm what possible solutions are there to solving this problem. You, it doesn't, you don't have to think of one perfect solution straight off the bat. Come up with multiple solutions, write them down. Whether they are crazy or not, you never know if they will actually become more feasible in the future. So keep them noted. Um, then, uh, fourth, fourth step is prototype. So since it was an engineering class, it was more related to like churning out physical products in the, in the case of code, it can be, still be a similar thing. You basically try to develop the most promising idea you have so far, try to make that into, um, 
a product and then you slowly polish it and try to see what the pros and cons are and compare it to your other ideas and try to see how you can improve it based on the different um, ideas you brainstorm initially. Then the last part is to test. It's basically like you test the product you develop with your end users. So I think this goes back to um, uh, a similar concept that Polly brought up in the talk this, um, that was last night in Philippine time. So uh, I remember she said, um, you shouldn't walk into a room assuming you know what the users want. Uh, or like with any striking assumptions about what the user wants. Because even if you feel like it, it might be obvious, like uh, you feel like, okay, yeah, I know that if someone's suffering from arthritis, I know that I just want to ease their pain. But like, what if, but if, you, especially if you're, in, if you don't have arthritis yourself, what if pain isn't the issue? Like what if it's just that you can't hold things properly? And so maybe the actual problem would be, uh, just holding something tighter or um, uh, yeah. So basically you want to get feedback from what you've made uh, of, of what you made from the end user group. So that's basically a test. So once you have that, that's basically your end product. So I think the most important there, most important step to remember there is that like, even if, even when you have your finished product, you still want to go back to your end users to make sure that they actually like want to use the product you develop because otherwise, who are you developing it for? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, um, there's, a, there's another question here. Um, oh, I'll, I'll paste it here just so you can refer to it. Um, being more blunt, did you feel education was more to fit a formula to a solution without much real space to innovate? Um, hmm. Do you feel education more fit to? Actually, okay, that is actually true though. Um, to, to an extent, I think uh, education in schools isn't as great as it could be. And I think like, education systems in general, like even the, like the Pisaia education system still has a lot of room to improve in. Um, and I think, yeah, especially like uh, the innovation projects we had were definitely fun, but I do think that it was, it wasn't as exciting for others as like, it wasn't exciting for everyone, especially when we had to like, still handle making those projects aside like alongside all our other requirements and that was definitely not the fun part of the innovation aspect um it was more to fit a formula to solution without much yeah i think especially like there could be a lot more like innovative like ways to do things and because simply because of like the how structured educate like the nature of education is it's just uh um it just it is kind of just like like fit it's like you're forced to fit to a specific formula which is why i think um the best way to like further your career in tech is to sort of um go out and take that initiative yourself because at the end of the day um you can't wait I mean, we want this education system to improve, but sometimes it might take too long and you can't always wait for them to improve. So sometimes you have to like, uh, take that extra mile yourself. Uh, do you have a checklist to help with deploying apps successfully to your intended end users? Um, I do not have a checklist, but I think um, an important part is an important thing to note is that you, like you try to find a source. I mean, not really a source, like try to find a group of your intended end users and like try to try to um, demonstrate your app to them, for example, so that like, and you can ask their feedback. So like, what do you think? Um, do you think this app is like useful? Ask them, um, like for example, if you're making an app that's meant to be used and like by drivers. Uh, so one app I developed before was like this public ride sharing app, which strapped GPs and um, it was for a hackathon. And I think 
definitely we had ways to go in improving the UX side of it. Because, I mean, considering the fact that jeepney drivers might not have access to phones to begin with, smart, uh, smartphones, or, and if they did, they need it to be accessible because most of the times, uh, most of the time their eyes will be on the road, not on the phone. So we needed to make improvements to that. So I think just the, instead of a checklist, just make sure that you try to address whatever concerns your end users would have with your app. Um, so uh, how do you manage to juggle schoolwork and your personal projects? How do you prioritize during conflicts? So that is a good question. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's sort of just like, you have to choose one or the other. Um, for me, I tried, I, like, I think there's like a third thing there, aside like juggle between the two, there's like a third thing that you can sacrifice to get more of the, those two, which is like sleep. So like mo most of high school, I sacrificed my sleep to juggle those two. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I still kind of do that now, but then I think it's it's also kind of fulfilling. I mean, I do I do not recommend losing like that's a very unhealthy lifestyle. I think losing sleep, um, but uh, I think you you will have to choose between schoolwork schoolwork or personal projects. Um, there, if you have some wiggle room to like maybe like uh, not study as much if you're already doing well in the subject, then maybe you could spend more time working on your personal projects. Or if you feel like you aren't doing that well in a particular subject and you need to spend more time studying, then maybe you can push your personal projects back a bit and spend more time in, with uh, school. Yeah, that's true. Oh, um, actually tying into, tying into this, uh, there's another question. Oh, well, yeah. One was, um, can you share some of your personal projects? And another one is, have you ever given up on a project? Okay. I have given up on so many projects. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, like, there are always those, uh, okay, I will, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I've given up on many projects in the past because sometimes it just didn't turn out to be as feasible as we originally thought it could be. Or um, just simply time constraint. Like I, I started on a project, but I couldn't bring it to fruition because of schoolwork or just like lack of time. But definitely um, just like having those ideas to begin with is like an important aspect. Like even if you end up um, not continuing your projects, I think it's important to write them down somewhere so that if ever later in the future, you want to look back and you can see, it's like, you know, those are your those are your little steps, your first steps. Um, even if you don't end up having anything to show for it, you can still look back and see your ideas like, oh, wow, I've gone this far. Because when you start taking that first step, all the tiny steps follow. And then before you know it, you've walked like, you've gone really far away from where you started and you don't realize how far you've gone until you start looking back at like, oh, I remember when I tried to do this and I couldn't do it. Like, I probably won't pick it up now, but it's still just like interesting to know. Uh, uh, yeah, some projects we worked on. Okay, since I think some people are talking about Daloy Drone, uh, some of my schoolmates and teammates. Yeah, so uh, one project we worked on in high school was this thing called Daloy. It is an acronym for something I do not remember anymore. Drone, atmospheric, something. So basically we were supposed to design it. We designed a drone, which actually worked for a bit. Uh, like it was controllable using a phone um, via Bluetooth and it would fly and basically measure, um, uh, we, it would measure atmospheric data. And so it was like a field research tool and a way to um, demonstrate physical concepts in the classroom. So like example, for physics, um, the change in pressure as you go down below water is linear. So as you go deeper, let's say you go, you go deeper by a factor of two, Your pr the pressure you experience goes up by a factor of two. But for atmospheric pressure, it is an exponential thing. So um, like these are a bunch of mathematical concepts, but then it's not that easy to demonstrate until like you see things in real life. And so like one, um, project I worked on with a team, many of them are in the chat, 
uh, was this thing called Daloy. And basically, with a we made a drone and submersible uh, vessel, which would measure pressure and a bunch of other like air and water parameters. So to demonstrate those um, classroom concepts in real life. Uh, another project uh, I worked on, so um, I can talk about Amihan. So uh, Ooh, okay. yeah, Amihan is, um, so it started last summer actually, although we didn't get to finish because we kind of ran out of time for summer and when school started, we kind of um, lost time to work on it. But then we're probably gonna try to continue it this summer, maybe after dashboard, after we finish stuff with dashboard, perhaps. But yeah, so like um, uh, Amihan was with a bunch of other people, like a lot of people. Uh, we tried to develop this um, modular air quality monitoring monitoring device. So we made an open source like schematic for building your own. Um, air monitoring device and we built a back-end system so that you could upload your air quality data to the servers and you could also view air quality in different parts of the Philippines on the website. Uh, um, yeah, and so we tried to make an air quality map of the Philippines. Unfortunately, we weren't able to like finish it in time for Taal, but uh, hopefully we'll get it done um, soon enough. We see a question from Jeremy. Uh, as someone who barely has not much coding experience, um, do you think peeps like me who can, without much experience, can still gain new knowledge here? <laughs> yeah, okay. For those who don't know, uh, Jeremy was my roommate in high school. Hello. Um, throughout six years of high school. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think like even if you don't have much coding experience, I think there is still like the, the motivation aspect here that you can take away from this talk because um, it's not just about tech. I think the whole idea of being able to make a difference in this world is uh, it's not limited to tech. In fact, like even with your writing, for example, uh, I know you're, st you're still continuing your writing now and I, I, feel, I think it's great that you are um, pursuing it now that you have a bit more time to explore and even just with like with writing even if it's not related to tech that still gives you the ability to impact the, and influence the world because um like there is a quote the pen is mightier than the sword I mean in this case uh pen is mightier than the laptop I mean I uh <laughs> but then like it's basically like with words are very powerful and um, definitely, even if you don't have much coding experience, it's just the motivation lesson I mentioned earlier, where you shouldn't be intimidated to take that step to make a difference in this world. Um, and actually related to that, uh, there's a question from Sean, although it was asked a bit earlier, uh, oh, okay. which is, how do you deal with um, coders block? Oh, yes. Dealing with coders block is really difficult, but like, I think usually coders, coders block can happen a lot, like with like burnout. So um, it's, it's not easy to get over and it definitely takes um, a different amount of time depending on like the instance. Like it, sometimes it's easier to get over your coding block, sometimes it's not. I think the best way is just really not to push yourself. If you if you have code, coders block, don't push yourself to try to code. Like give yourself some time to rest first. And then um, when you feel like you've rested enough, I think that's when you can take a like take a breather, um, walk around a bit, uh, get fresh air. And then when you think that you've relaxed enough, try to give it another shot. Um, Jill, I see Jillian's uh, yeah, question. Uh, I'm trying to widen my knowledge in tech and the business aspect of it. Um, what would you suggest to broaden my knowledge in it? Any online modules, websites, or tips? So um, regarding 
tech and the business aspect of it. I think there are a lot of YouTube channels that um, keep you up to date with like tech news, and there are definitely a lot of like newsletters um, that keep you up to date with the new things that are happening with tech. Uh, like there is Retail Brew. I actually got, I discovered that from Chia. I think she shared it a few like last year, I think, and that's like how I found out about Retail Brew. Uh, they're like email newsletters that talk, that update you with tech stuff. There are also a lot of, yeah, uh, Morning Brew, yeah. And there are also a lot of like, actually like Philippine tech newsletters. Um, so I, um, Develop has one. Uh, I think there's also like invites.dev. Um, yeah, there, I think like being updated, up to date with these newsletters is uh, really helpful. And, and like learning more about tech because like tech just changes so much. Like just knowing the like current events helps a lot. Um, also, uh, you could watch YouTube channels. I think there are a lot that make like um, tech videos. They don't go, they're not necessarily like tutorials, but they just like talk about like recent happenings in tech. So like maybe you can see people talking about like, um, oh, this thing with uh, Windows and WSL, and like, I don't know what WSL is, and you want to learn more about it, you can um, search on YouTube. I think, I'm, I can't think of any channels off the top of my head, but I know there are quite a few that make like vlog style posts and hype up these news, so they're like pretty interesting. Yeah, so there's, um, there's another question, which is, Oh, actually, two questions that are tied in together. Um, one is, do you have any tips for what to look for when building a team? Um, and aside from that, what would be your ideal work environment? Okay, so um, we're looking for a team. I think uh, definitely it helps to have uh, diversity and to be able to learn, like to be able to learn from the people in your team. Um, I think I remember uh, there is this quote. Um, I can't remember where it's from, but they, uh, it goes like, if you're the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room. Uh, when you look for a team, you don't want to be the person who's going to carry the team, but you also don't want to be the person who's going to um, just like be your weight. You want to be able to contribute and you want everyone in your team to be able to contribute. and. To do that, you want to find people who you feel share the same drive as you or similar drive as you, but who can complement your skills and or who can teach you new skills and who you can also teach. I think that's like a great idea. I mean, it's always it's also great to work with people who know a lot more than you. And that's also that's always a learning opportunity. And if you work with people who don't know as much as you, you can, it's also a way for, an opportunity for you to teach them. Um, but yeah, you want to look for people who can complement your skill set because um, that helps both of, that helps you and all your other team members grow. Uh, for my ideal work environment, um, I well, when I'm coding, I just I don't know I I can just uh, well, it's usually at night. <laughs> I mean, I can code in the morning, but usually at like at night, I think is when I'm most productive and like. I sometimes listen to lo-fi, study hip-hop music, or um, any other music, really. Honestly, when I code, I, like, I just zone out, so I don't listen. Like, even if, sometimes I will code for, like, three hours and realize that I didn't turn on any music. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, wait. Or, like, I'm wearing earphones, and, like, there's nothing playing. I only realized that three hours later. Oh, um, there's a... There's another question, um, which is, aside from formal academic resources, can you suggest other out-of-the-classroom resources that are useful for learning the code, um, like coding memes? Actually, coding memes help. <laughs> I mean, okay, so when you're learning to code, I think um, one problem is, like, if you don't know where to start, like, um, if, like, you want to learn how to code, but what exactly do I learn? What programming language should I start with? Um, 
I think coding memes kind of help me with that. Like I remember before, I was like, machine learning is cool and all, but I didn't know anything about machine learning. So then I, I but I subscribed to a lot of like uh, Facebook meme pages and then like CS meme pages, and then I'd be like, oh, TensorFlow and PyTorch and stuff, and I'd be like, oh, what's that? So I Google them and I'm like, oh, okay, I see, and then they have tutorials, and then I can branch off from there. It's sort of like Wikipedia, like you can use it to like um, get a. a so much shallow idea of like what things are and then you can do your own research on on those topics uh coffee chocolate mountain dew or five hour energy actually i'm more of a tea person <laughs> uh i am a very much a tea person i drink tea to stay awake i can pull off all-nighters with tea. Coffee, I mean, coffee is fine, but it just dehydrates me so much. And it it, it makes my head itch. It's weird. Um, but yeah, I prefer tea. It keeps me awake. It's fine. And it's, it doesn't make me feel good. Um, tea is great. Um, I generally, I like, yes, actually, well, that was my thing in, in high school because that was the only thing available. That was the only tea I could get, like, in in high school. So I'd always get Chai Lee Wan green tea from 7-Eleven because there was, like, a 7-Eleven in, in Argao where my high school was. Um, but, like, now that I brought tea and I have hot, I can actually make hot water. I just get, oh, no, it's not, it's not, so uh, it's on the, town it's like not like we have to go down to the town proper to get to the 7-eleven so like i'll get shyly one if i like just arrive on campus yeah our school was on a mountain just like uh, fyi <laughs> dude that's so cool so it's like five kilometers from the main road up a mountain and like if you go up you can actually see like there are parts where you can just topple down the side of the mountain it's funny <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry, 3.5 kilometers, not 5 kilometers. Um, yes, not concerning at all. Yeah, recently I've been into matcha though. Like, matcha is surprisingly more potent than green tea in terms of like caffeine and so in keeping me awake. But also, it's a lot healthier. Yeah, so my high school was basically three hours away from Cebu City where I actually live. Well, it's technically two hours, but three hours most of the time because of traffic. And then, yeah, it's another, like, five, ten minutes going up the mountain. I mean, you can drive there, but then, like, it's just, yeah. Um, actually, there is a question that kind of uh, requires this context of the school that you went to, because you said it was on a mountain, and um, you said that you went to school here in the Philippines. But, yeah. um this is uh, unrelated to tech, but somebody um, asked if you, if you have any call, like tips for oh. those who want to study in the U.S. too. Um, I wonder if this is, I'm not sure, is MG in this call? Um, but okay, I actually made a talk about this in high school. Oh, that's MG, okay. Um, yeah, I, I made a talk for this actually in high school and I prepared like a whole presentation about this. Like, um, I gave like an, a one hour talk on this and I have a video of it on my Google Drive. Um, I prefer that if you like, uh, you can message me or Chia, I guess, and um, I can share the video with you. I prefer not to post it like out there in public, but like, um, Feel free to message me. I will, sh or like, get in touch with um, anyone from Develop, and I can share the video with you. Um, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I think it it would go into more detail than like any like uh, shallow tips I can just get off the top of my head right now. Okay. Um, so yeah, another thing that. Um, you mentioned was so one of the things that got you into um, doing social good uh, coding for social good is um, doing projects right mm -hmm. um, someone has asked do you recommend to join hackathons for social good what are some benefits that you can get from them 
I think hackathons are definitely um, a fun way to like sort of just like dive into it. Because for me, um, I've actually only joined like one hackathon and I've helped organize one hackathon. And that's it. I've joined, the other contests I've joined weren't hackathons, but like you just, you make stuff on your own time and then you present them. But I think hackathons are a good way to like get, exp- it's like, it's a push because like, um, you will want, you, uh, when you want to learn like these new platforms and frameworks, you will take some time to learn them. But when you join hackathons, there's like that added pressure for like time. And there's just, just that adrenaline rush and like being, you get that experience of working in a team to develop a product as quickly as you can. And I mean, I think it is a, a good way. Like if you have the time and resources to join a hackathon for social good, um, go for it. Uh, benefits you can get from them probably like if, if you would if you can win then yeah there are those clear benefits um but most of the time i mean you don't i don't think you should necessarily join a hackathon just because you expect to win i think just joining the hackathon itself is a wonderful experience because you get to um you get to learn um team management um working under intense pressure and just like you get to have fun coding and doing things. Um. Oh, um, from a question from Sean. Uh, <laughs> I lost 80% of my dream team last year. How do I continue coding for good? It's okay, Sean. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I mean, you can still code for good. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can still code for good. I mean, um, it. I think what matters is like, uh, I, what matters is the drive to be able to code for good. You want to be able to have that fire within you to persevere and like make things. And I think it 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 won't. Um, it won't matter if I'm there or not, because once you get that spark going, you will, you can steam forward whether or not I'm there. Um, yeah. Um, um, you asked a question, I think, about the- there's, like, Yeah, oh, there's a question. Um, for those who don't have um, the resources to code, um, what, can you, what can they do to make a difference in society through tech? Okay, um, that is a good question. Uh, I think, yeah, it, it's not as evident at first because like most of the time people associate um, tech with computers and code. But I, I think tech is a lot broader than that. Um, I know some people who got involved with like making um, different innovative projects without having to touch code. Um, but even then that, that still requires some material resources. Uh, you, you don't necessarily have to like create things to get, to make a difference in society through tech, whether it's, uh, simply like, whether it's like joining, um, prod, uh, organizations that advocate for more tech awareness, like develop or, um, um, being able to like, just like, uh, learn more about tech in general, not necessarily coding, but just like, uh, different like devices like like, what is like android is a mobile operating system or something and like maybe you can help educate people in your community that is still making the difference in this world so like spreading awareness yes spreading awareness helping um helping people uh um there's another one um when fixing coding issues how do you balance between experimenting on your own and looking up established solutions like when do you know to keep trying and when do you check the internet? That is a very good and relevant question to me because that just happened to me a few days ago where I apparently wasted two days of work trying to implement something that was already implemented. <laughs> so um, I think it's definitely, um, I, I think if if you're allowed to like look up code on the internet, I think it would be better to do that because it's generally just more efficient. Like the reason why tech has grown so much is because it is collaborative. Um, 
you shouldn't feel pressured to just make something yourself, even if it already exists, just for the sake of saying that, oh, I made this. Unless you're trying to like practice, um, practice certain like new tools, concepts, or frameworks, um, you can. Uh, I think it's it's better to like just use established stuff. Um, when you want to like implement something yourself, that's probably if you like you're sure that it hasn't been implemented already because otherwise you're just reinventing the wheel and that you're doing more work than necessary. Um, I mean, you can flex that you solve a difficult problem yeah. on your own, but then like you're still just like kind of doing it to your own detriment. I mean, sure, if, if, if you want to flex on that, then that's fine. But to be more efficient, I think it helps to just use something that's already been established. And then build off of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I think we've actually run out of time. <laughs> um, yeah, the response you've been getting is amazing, dude. Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that was... Okay, so I guess we can take just this uh, one last question then since it was sent before we announced so it was the end. Um, is Google your best friend to learning while implementing or do you learn then you implement? I think definitely a bit of both. Um, Google, I, I mean like I worked on projects before I learned, the, oh, like when I learned to make Minecraft mods, I think, okay, I definitely want to learn before I implement, but in my experience, I've always ended up having to implement before I learned properly. So like uh, when I first learned to make Minecraft plugins, for example, I learned to make mods before I actually learned Java. So I was like watching a tutorial for like how to make Minecraft mods. And I was like, what is this public static void? Uh, I, I'll just ignore that for now. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, and that, that means integer, I think. Um, but I think it's great to have like, if there's something that's really in, like complicated or like it seems intimidating, I think it helps to like learn a bit about it first. So you have a general idea of how things work and then you can go from there. If you feel a bit more confident, you uh, work on the small parts. And then if, you, if you're confused about something, learn a bit more, implement, learn, implement. I think it's just like you do a bit of both as you go along. Yeah, that makes sense. Especially because sometimes you don't know what to look for uh, until you're actually working on a project and then you have a problem that only comes up while you're working on a project. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I think that's it. Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess that's a wrap, guys. Thank you so much for... One last joke. Oh. Where? One last joke. Uh, <laughs> oh. um, I don't know. Let's see. Um, I like to say I just joke. Public static void main is public static void pain. <laughs> um, let's see. Ah, oh, pressure. Uh, Your favorite coding joke. Um, I can't think of my favorite. I mean, okay, I can only think of like one <laughs> coding joke. <laughs> I can think of one coding joke, but it's like so cliche and it's old. I'm pretty sure everyone's heard of it now. Um, but I think it relates to me because I am, uh, I, I was originally, like my first language is Java. So it's like a Java joke. So like, um, uh, Why do Java programmers wear glasses? Um, yeah, I think it's like everyone knows the answer to this joke. <laughs> uh, because they can't see sharp. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Although C sharp is actually very nice. Uh, I, I personally never had any reason to learn it extensively, but I learned it once just to see, uh, just to see it and it's actually like, Pretty good. <laughs> the joke went C flat. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, all right, well. All right, well, so that was the last joke, I guess. Um, oh, wait, okay, wait, I think I have a, a better ooh, okay. joke. Okay. okay. But it's okay, it's, it's warning, it's, it's still kind of bad, though. Um, uh, so, okay, there's a villain, and he's uh -huh. trying to make himself seem like a good person. Like, he's a villain hacker, and he tries okay. to make himself um, appear like a, an altruistic person and not actually a villain. Um, mm -hmm. He establishes a company to give the public a message that he is good and not evil. What is the name of his company? <laughs> what? Hiroko. <laughs> Hiroko. Okay, yeah, that's my bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, you okay. made an effort. Yeah, it's, so. a, it's a Filipino joke, just um, FYI. Uh, because ko means me, so like I am a hero. Yeah, uh, it's a. Uh, I think it's better than the Java C sharp joke though, because that's like that's already old. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm also laughing because it's. I think it's both. <laughs> it's both funny and bad. <laughs> funny because it is bad. Yes. <laughs> Um, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, any more jokes or? Uh, I think, I think I'm good for now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, if you guys are interested. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Um, if you guys are interested, we are developers having a game night, and there maybe you guys can share your jokes. Maybe he'll come up with better jokes by then if he joins. Uh, yeah, so she has put up the links in the chat. Um, yeah, it's 8 p.m. onwards, Philippine time. Uh, join us, guys. Let's have some fun. Thank you so much um, for hosting me. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to give this talk. Um, and for answering all of our questions. And thanks to everybody who uh, joined. Thanks to everybody who asked questions and gave jokes. All right, so, yeah. Oh, okay, I guess that's a wrap then. Thank you guys. Thank you all for coming. And thank you so much, Graham. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you so much for hosting me.